كده All right, so we are going to talk today about SEO and AI. Specifically, we're going to talk about how the emergence of AI has kind of uh, changed the way that SEO works, both in terms of uh, functionality, um, but also in the ways that we can work with SEO. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into it. My name is Jen McFarland, and I uh, run a consulting group called Merit Digital that tries to help with your digital solutions for your small business and team. And we're gonna talk about uh, you know, a, a brief cross section of why this is important right now. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of SEO basics. We'll talk about who runs the world of search. Um, and then this question that some people sort of have, which is, am I training my replacement? Is there just a world of AI out there that's, that's being created? Um, we'll eventually get to a point where we're starting to look ahead uh, and maybe this is uh, the question that we should start with, but does SEO matter anymore is where we will wrap up. So when we look at the data, uh, we find that uh, we're talking about this because AI is such a significant uh, and, uh, and overwhelming impact on uh, our productivity. So when we take a look at this, 158% is uh, how much more productive users find that they are when they're using chat GPT instead of Google. Um, and this is measured in the number of uh, tasks or questions that they're able to complete per hour when they're doing a search with search uh, with Google versus with AI. Um, but this is a cross section, 158% uh, is sort of where it tops out. That's more than two and a half times more effective. But even if you're using, uh, you know, AI for something like programming, uh, it's at 126% increase for those using like GitHub Copilot, for example. So the impact of AI across the board is higher productivity. But beyond that, users uh, who use ChatGPT, for an example, prefer that to Google. So they find the information quality, the ease of use, uh, the enjoyment. Key among this, the enjoyment is a whole 1.3 points greater on ChatGPT versus Google. Um, so what we're finding is that uh, at least for now, it might be novelty, but people prefer using ChatGPT, they get better answers and they get them faster. So if we're going to recap SEO a little bit, um, SEO stands for search engine optimization, which is our uh, efforts to increase a website's traffic via search results. That is to say that if somebody searches that they wind up at your site organically uh, as opposed to through ads or other links. Um, so organic search results are non-paid. We use keywords to represent the content on our site and it's important that we do some keyword research, um, maybe consider the ranking of different keywords to establish which ones are the best used for our site to draw traffic. Now, SERPs are the acronym for the search engine result pages. And this is something that's evolved quite a bit over the last a few years, but especially in the last year. So this is essentially what we see when we do a search in Google, the results from that query. Um, and in the last year or two, couple of years, there's been a number of things that Google specifically has done to um, sort of jazz up that search and landing page. Um, in, uh, in specific, there are videos, they've started to include tweets, which I think they've pulled back from more recently. Uh, and then there's snippets, which are these Google uh, formatted search results that often include the common questions that go with our search query, um, and then the, the sort of subsequent questions that may arise. Um, and so this is what we've been seeing more and more on our search landing pages. And of course, now we're starting to move into a world where uh, generative AI responses are part of that result as well. So this SGE stands for the delivery search generative experience, which is the delivery of uh, the AI overviews of results. Um, so, you know, this is kind of what it would look like. Uh, it, when it started out, Google was only releasing this kind of result um, for those who had opted in. And that was about a year ago that that first began to be deployed, but very limited. Uh, for, for a very limited audience. For example, for a long time, those who had Google Workspace uh, were not able to see these kinds of results. Um, now it's pretty ubiquitous. I think you may have to opt out to <laughs> avoid it at this point, uh, but there are a few things that we wanna highlight about this. One is this is a very different look from that SERP sort of demo that we showed that had you know, maps and tweets and the little you know, blurbs and uh, extensions 
that uh, showed up before. And, and so you see there are no ads here. There's really just essentially the answers. Um, and it's taken up a lot of space, right? You're, you're definitely gonna have to scroll before you get to anything else, including search results. So this really represents a, a pretty significant shift away from the past sort of Google traditional results. Obviously I've been talking a lot about Google. So the answer for who runs search to some extent is Google. Um, we are all familiar, I believe, with Google Chrome, which is the Google browser, uh, and then Google Analytics, which is the most popular tracking tool. The Google Search Console is a supplementary tool that can help uh, help you understand how the keywords that you're using result in people visiting your site. And then Google Ads, if you are paying for, uh, for placement in Google search results, you're going to work through Google Ads. So really, they have evolved kind of a lockdown on this whole process between uh, how you're browsing the internet, how they're evaluating what you're doing on there, and then how uh, the, the payment results in where people go to. So it's, uh, they, they really got this on lockdown. In fact, 84% of sites that use some kind of traffic analytics tools use Google Analytics. So uh, again, I don't think there's any organization in the world that has more data on how people are using the internet. So to that point, point, um, Google uh, and AI, there seems like there would be a lot of potential here. Um, AI uh, has been around for longer than just, you know, since November of 2022, when uh, ChatGPT came out. And, and a lot of the early use cases are, uh, again, things like, you know, autofill and, uh, and also in search. And so returning uh, the search algorithm is powered by AI auto filling. So when you start to type in your search and it sort of uh, suggests future words that you might want to fill in, obviously that's AI powered. So Google has been uh, deep into AI for a long time. Um, they were a developer of Google Lens and Google Translate, which were two of their other technologies um, that, that were built with early AI. And they con uh, pioneered the concept of attention is all you need, which is actually the core behind uh, the sort of chat GPT generative AI models where it allows more success in the results because it's focusing on the uh, key portions, the transformative portions of the prompt uh, and resulting in better responses. So they did a lot of focus on search, a lot of research on search, but what we saw from what Google learned is, uh, I'm sorry, search on AI, but what they learned from it seemed to be directly uh, put back into how search functions and not necessarily pushed into this new frontier. So Google is actually kind of in a tough spot now. They're struggling to catch up with other AI companies. Uh, they originally re released BARD, which had a uh, lackluster performance and Gemini, which has replaced it, has kind of had many of the similar problems in part because Google is a very popular product um, and people I think have, uh, have really been keeping an eye on what it's doing. So things like this, where uh, people have been prompting Gemini with uh, examples and then receiving these sort of um, uh, highly diverse ahistorical responses has gotten a lot of attention. Um, although I will say this is another example. This is, in case you can't read the captions, uh, examples of professional American football players, none of which are women, of course. Um, and then uh, a group of American people in American colonial times, none of which were Asian American, and then founding fathers. And uh, this actually, these this result comes from Meta and not from, uh, Gemini, but people aren't talking about Meta's flaws because they're not, they don't have the expectations for Meta that they seem to have for Google. Um, so we're definitely seeing where uh, this kind of content has undermined Google and undermined it in the market. And at the same time, Google is losing major revenue streams from things like Google ads sort of being pushed down and usurped by uh, the generative AI responses. So Google's, Google's not probably not loving the AI uh, emergence as much as some other companies like Microsoft. So Microsoft has Bing, which is their uh, search tool. And comparatively, it has a smaller, much smaller market share than Google. However, uh, that's changing, which we'll talk about in a minute. They also have their own tools similar to Google, like Outlook uh, and Office 365. They have open 
AI, which they don't technically have. However, um, there is a massive partnership with them involving a tremendous investment by Microsoft into OpenAI. And of course, they have Copilot, which uh, uses the OpenAI tools to power a lot of the AI within those um, Office uh, and, and other Microsoft tools. So Microsoft is, you know, essentially in bed with the most popular AI tool that's out there and, and it's working for them. And to that point, uh, we see where while it's been relatively stable be between 80 and 90% for, uh, you know, eight years or something, we're starting to see where Google's market share of search is beginning to decline. Um, a few kind of points here. It was already starting to come down some when um, ChatGPT was released. Uh, we did see that it spiked a bit when the search generative experience launched. And so while people may have uh, tried to work with that some and, and play with that, it seems like users don't enjoy working with that or, or they appreciate whatever Microsoft is offer, uh, offering better because Bing has uh, sort of taken a comparatively large chunk of that market. Um, there are other tools out there. I've heard quite a few anecdotally from people using uh, more of Bing and more of DuckDuckGo. So it does seem like um, for sure Google is, is losing market share here. And it'll be interesting to see how that continues to evolve. Um, one of the sort of key features here is that there were 1 billion AI chats on Bing in 2023. So uh, to point out here, uh, the AI chats that are available in Bing are offered through ChatGPT. So for a while, especially uh, when OpenAI was kind of struggling with, um, you know, uh, it, leveraging the tools and, and beginning to uh, reach more users, for a while, this was the only way to connect with ChatGPT or, or to talk to it um, or to use the GPT-4 was to use it through Bing's interface. And so there were a lot of users who prompted it with the things that they needed throughout uh, throughout their day, but just using it on Bing. The other thing uh, to look at with search that's um, maybe something that wasn't a big deal in the past is that the, Ger uh, the Google search algorithm does not predict or prioritize correct answers. Um, and it never has, but we didn't care before. Uh, I think there's certainly been sort of uh, both a focus and a reprioritization of accuracy and the responses that we get. Um, and so now that we expect that our answers may be flawed when we search something like ChatGPT, uh, we're a little bit more on the lookout for this fake news and hallucinations, and we're a little bit more careful about sourcing our data. And to that end, there is another tool that sort of emerged recently, which is called Perplexity. Uh, this is another large language model, but it's uh, it calls itself an answer engine and it's purporting to replace search. So, or, or more es essentially to replace Google or Bing. The idea being that your experience with search should be something like you go into this large language model or more accurately, maybe their extension, you do your search, you get a short, very simple response um, which is very counter to what you get from a, a chat GPT, for example, which tends to be super wordy. It's a very brief response, and then it includes citations that you can just click on to see the source of the information. Uh, so this is something that a lot of users are um, seem to be enjoying much more. I would be really curious to see that previous chart that looks uh, at search, not just through something like Google and Bing, but also tried to see what market share perplexity was starting to fill. So one of the questions, by the way, how's everybody doing? <laughs> you still hanging in there? Yeah. Great. Yep, all good. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that uh, occasionally I hear from folks is sort of this question of, uh, am I training my replacement? Am I putting all this information out there on the web that they're just going to suck up and train the AIs with? Uh, and that's a very fair question. Uh, web crawlers have always been used by search companies like Google, um, but now they're also, and they have also been being used by OpenAI and other tools to train LLMs. We just weren't really aware of it, but now we are. Um, so at, at this point, again, to reiterate, most of the training for uh, most large language models has just come from information that's been scraped from the web and just fed directly into these giant models. So. 
uh, if you're concerned about that and you no longer want your data to be collected and used to train large language models, then you have a few uh, things that you can do. And there are a couple of reasons why you might want to. So if you have proprietary information on your site and you don't want it to be shared with that attribution, first of all, you should probably have it protected behind a password or something, but, uh, but you could also block crawlers, um, uh, AI crawlers that are, are sucking this information in. Uh, possibly you don't mind sharing it, but you don't want to share it with the AI. You you know want to protect your copyright. You want to uh, be financially compensated in some way for this work that uh, the you know that these companies are going to then turn around and use and sell. Or you manage really complex content and you're uh, aware of the potential for hallucinations or for some negative connotation to come back to your business. At the same time. You know, there are reasons not to block the crawlers. Um, this is sort of a case where we are all contributing to the general knowledge of information that's out on the internet. Um, and there's something to be said for the more information that you have, that you have created and then shared and that's been used to train uh, these models reinforces your position and the solutions that you endorse. So there is something to be said for having your voice be projected and included into you know, the larger body of knowledge. Uh, there's also blocking the crawlers. You know, Some traffic is better than no traffic. Uh, according to Jacob Nielsen, who is a, a UX uh, legacy, um, and, and he helped sort of pilot that uh, industry. Uh, and he's correct. Uh, I mean, right, if you want people to, to come to your site, you kind of have to get yourself out there. And then if you want to stay in the conversation, you know, if you are contributing, then you uh, should certainly be able to continue to contribute your opinion on how these things are being used uh, going forward. So a few more vocabulary lessons here. Um, the index is essentially uh, all the sites that a search engine knows about uh, in, in the context of uh, crawling the web. The, the web crawl is the search engine's process of looking through all the pages that exist, specifically seeking out new pages or updated pages. Backlinks are links from uh, a website that point back to your site. And then the robots.txt file is a file that you can and should have in the root of your site that designates what, what a crawler should do with your content. Um, the default is nothing. Uh, but you may want to go in there and uh, clarify which folders are not for search or are not for indexing uh, and which ones are. Now, uh, this is something that companies are aware of. So at the end of 2023, 48% of news sites specifically were blocking OpenAI's crawlers and 24% of, uh, of news sites were blocking Google crawlers. So it's kind of interesting to me that to some extent, Google is seen as less dangerous perhaps, or maybe less well-known. Um, I think this is also very useful from the perspective of if somebody is doing a search and they're counting on uh, either one of these large language models to deliver responses based on up-to-date information, the fact that some of these sites are blocking access to, to that news uh, could impact the responses. So uh, if you're thinking about blocking access to your content, there are some things to consider. Uh, the first one is that for anything that's already on the web, you're probably too late. If you don't have a robots file in place, chances are at some point it, your site may have already been indexed by a uh, large language model of some kind. And there is no way to take back your content or to have a model forget what it's been trained on. So. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with this concept, the you know the information for from a very <laughs> vague description is kind of sucked in there, and and then it's contributed to the larger body of knowledge, and there's no pulling out that specific content. Uh, most websites, uh, especially those for big tech and online resources, you've probably already agreed through whatever privacy policy or user agreement to have your data train the AI. Not in every case, but in a lot of cases, um, I in particular would keep an eye on uh, things like Zoom and some other tools that uh, might be collecting uh, transcripts or other uh, content to review. Some tools will not let you opt out. And this is particularly the case for things that are like free tools. So Microsoft Copilot, if you are using that, 
as far as I understand it, there's no way to say no to Copilot in terms of it's collecting that information and training. Uh, this is a link here and the resources will be available at the end for a recent list of sites that will help you to identify what policies are in place and where you can opt out. So that can be extremely helpful if you do wanna go through this process. And if you wanna try and find another way around this, something like rate limiting can restrict requests for uh, a page from a single user or a tool uh, and that can help to mitigate the situation. If you want to entirely block your site, you want to use your robots.txt file. Again, this goes in the root of your folder, so it should you know, basically be at your URL slash robots.txt. And you're going to be establishing rules uh, that will limit or restrict access by user agents. Um, and so it's gonna look something, oh, right, a few defaults. The default is that everything is available to crawl the whole site uh, and this is notable, the search generative experience that we demoed earlier that is showing up, if you block that, you are going to block Google entirely. So you will no longer show up in Google search results, um, which is a fairly uh, conniving little way <laughs> of requiring that you kind of keep that open. So again, here's kind of a model of what this might look like. If you wanted to block Google, uh, you could do that specifically. I've disallowed the archive folder and the images folder from being searched. Um, and you can also uh, do a star to cover all user agents. And um, essentially these two lines, the fourth and fifth ones here are allowing all user agents to access everything in the directory, which is the default anyway. But these are some examples of uh, sort of the structure. The other thing that's a good idea to have is a sitemap which will allow you to uh, you know, compile a list and organize all of your content so that the search engine uses that to understand um, what information you have and, and what kind of information it is. So if we look into the future, uh, there is this scenario that plenty of people have, uh, have considered and are afraid of, which is that the world uh, of the internet is really just AI generated content, right? And this is done by um, more and more people are using AI to write their content, particularly marketing content, which is what goes on the web, which is what's searched and what's returned in search results and is what we read. And then is what the AI subsequently trains on. And then it just creates more and more AI generated content. And eventually everything on the web is crap. Uh, so, I mean, is, is this going to happen? Uh, how much are people worried about this? Um, Google's certainly worried about it. They are doing some things to uh, better understand the intent of search and deliver better responses. Um, and the idea being here that it's gonna make it harder to sort of game the system by, you know, some of the sort of strategies that have existed are to use a lot of keywords, to use a lot of uh, popular phrases, it ge basically generate posts that are just, you know, this kind of high profile um, AI, uh, or I'm sorry, SEO uh, designed garbage. Um, and so Google is really trying to push back from that and avoid it. They've confirmed uh, as of last month that high quality content is where the priority is and it is what's uh, crawled most often in order to stay up to date. They're also cracking down on spam, uh, including clickbait. And then this scaled AI abuse is uh, a strategy that some spammers and, um, and others have tried to put out there where they take over legitimate domains after they're uh, dropped. So occasionally like a, a major organization or a news site or something will go out of business and they let go of their domain. And so some of these will, um, will take over those domains and then just put in their own AI generated garbage um, because the, the domain and the URL starts with a higher uh, priority. So let's talk about the other side of uh, AI with uh, SEO, which is generating content, right? So like, how do we do this and how do we do it well? The key to SEO success, as I mentioned, Google is going to prioritize good content and that's always gonna be the case. Um, that's how they prioritize their crawling. And you want to be focusing on high quality user-centric content, um, relevance and user experience in particular. So anytime you can start to connect the information you have to real world experiences, whether they be personal or anecdotal from someone else, um, 
that kind of stuff is the stuff that Google is looking for. And to that end, there's a little acronym that can help you remember this. This is a, a slide that's making me very hungry at lunchtime here because I can't eat until we're done. Um, but this is the EEAT, the experience, expertise, authority, and trust are the things that you should be aiming for. Uh, and to be clear, it used to just be one E. Uh, Google expanded that because uh, there is a difference here. Uh, it's, it's a case of an experienced instructor who has been teaching for 20 years, for example, versus the uh, expertise that, or the yeah, that's experience, versus the expertise that is um, maybe something that you've developed from certifications or from lots of training or something like that. So these are the things that they want to see. Uh, authority, trust. Uh, trust is something that has to evolve with more time, but it is very important. Uh, and referencing your materials and, and then continuing to post kind of routinely with that quality connection, those are really strong factors for, um, for Google. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some keys to success, publish often and publish consistently. Um, links and references are really important wherever you can cite your sources and uh, particularly that those sources are highly, highly relevant results, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, having a Google business profile and other social content, that's always something, uh, whenever you can kind of link to another Google resource, Google tends to like that. So if you are aiming to improve in Google specifically search results, those are helpful. Um, and again, referencing the sites that have the most credibility is uh, going to sort of give you bigger bang for your buck. Uh, in particular, things like EDUs tend to have a higher uh rating and, and more authority. Uh, so anytime you can sort of reach back to those kinds of resources is good. How do you know if content is credible? There are a few places, uh, of course, we don't know what Google's algorithm does directly, but these are some places where uh, you can sort of look for things that are, are known to be more reputable. Um, you have to pay for some of this information, but um, there is NewsGuard, which hosts both a health guard and a misinformation site um, that kind of document the known sources of misinformation or uh, they, the NewsGuard and HealthGuard have their own lists of quality sources. Uh, Wikipedia has a couple of sources, the reliable sources list and the page patrol source guide. Both of these are gonna be linked in the materials and they're very extensive uh, sources of reliable information. I mean, essentially, Wiki, uh, Wikipedia has to know which kinds of sites can be sourced for their uh, data. So they're a really great um, place to look for that. And then All Sides is an interesting one where they're giving you uh, news with both uh, like sort of liberal, progressive, and conservative bent, and then also uh, a, a central bent. Um, or I guess not been like sort of the, the central focus of the information. So if you're aiming to look for uh, an unbiased source, uh, looking in there in the middle of the road results can help. So when we're actually creating content for SEO or creating content in general, how can we use AI? And this is probably not gonna be news for many of you, but there's lots of great ways to do that. Uh, to generate ideas, to do outlines and first drafts, I am, never going to tell you that anything that you should publish to the web is what comes right out of an AI, um, but it can be very helpful for giving you ideas and for giving you a place to start. It's also great to review the information that you've written. So after uh, you've done the work and you've written something that is great, maybe your last step before it goes out the door is to just take one more look, read it for errors, read it for uh, readability. If there's anything that's confusing, um, that is a great way to use your AI. Also to create punchy titles and headings, I'm not talking about clickbait here, but if you wanna be cute or alliterative, uh, the AI is good at that. Reviewing your site's meta tags and alt tags, descriptions on images, there's lots of tools that will supplement uh, some of that information. Um, and then also kind of having AI take a look at the content that you've written from the point of view of your target audience that can really help hone in on some of your messaging. Uh, finally, this last piece is uh, more complicated than a single line in a bullet point, but uh, you can have a lot of success by training your AI on past content, and that can help generate, even if it's just for the first draft um, or for reviewing it, more authentic output, something that really represents either you personally or your organization. 
Um, and there's a couple of different ways of doing this. One is uh, to use few shot prompting. So if you're not familiar with this concept, uh, few shot prompting is something where you're able to use a couple of examples to generate the desired output. And it's been shown repeatedly in uh, research that few shot prompting gives you more successful prompts. It's possible to have success with what's called zero shot prompting, so basically not using any examplers, uh, but you have to work a little harder at describing uh, some of the other things that you need. So filling in more about the context or your target audience, for example. Uh, to that end, something like the retrieval uh, RAG, retrieval augmented generation, this is sort of a, a way of using few shot, but instead of necessarily providing those examples in your prompt, you're able to reference a separate database or resource that has those examples in them. So in this case, it would uh, allow you to have like an LLM that has sort of this side uh, side knowledge or side input that uh, each prompt can go through to sort of be informed of how uh, you want the output to look. Um, and that's great. Obviously, it's, it's uh, more challenging to achieve. There's more uh, technical setup for that. Uh, and these days, it's kind of less necessary because uh, more and more of the latest LLMs are uh, being established with these large context windows. And context windows are essentially the number of tokens that, um... oh, hi there, Thomas, welcome. Oh, sorry, hello. I didn't realize hi. I was unmuted. That's okay. Um, so yeah, the context window is going to allow a, a, a large language model to work with a larger uh, context of information. Um, so it's going to be able to, uh, use a larger number of words in order to uh, determine the response. So something that we're sort of, we say words, but it's any kind of input. So if you're able to uh, submit maybe a couple of examples of past articles along with your prompt, uh, it's going to work almost the same way as a retrieval augmented generation or, or the RAG process, because you're gonna be giving it some of that extra uh, supporting examples within the prompt itself, but just a lot more information. So another way that AI is going to uh, be really powerful tool with SEO is in keyword strategy. Um, so again, keywords are important because you want to identify the keywords that your users are using to find you. Uh, you wanna include those in your content, ideally more organically than just stuffing them in all of your information. Um, but then the next step beyond that is uh, being more strategic with your keywords. So looking for outliers, what are some keywords that um, that people are using that you're not really thinking of. And there's a few ways to find those. Um, one is to sort of consider how people search. So more and more people are searching um, with, uh, with recording. So they're speaking into their phone or something like that in order to do the search, or if they're speaking to Alexa, for example, and they might be combining multiple concepts or doing something in a question, uh, so some different phrasing that maybe you haven't, looked for from your keywords in the past. So that's one way to look. Um, the other thing to consider is that the higher the search volume, so the more popular the keyword, the harder it's gonna be to be successful in the results for that. So a lot of times what we wanna be looking for are the less competitive keywords um, or what's called long tail keywords. Those are ones that are more like a phrase. Um, so they're, they're, there's a little bit more to them. Uh, and then the other thing is just to seek out emerging keywords in your industry. And this too is a place where AI is really good at finding these uh, because it has access to so much information and it can process it so quickly. Uh, prompting with AI can often return things that maybe haven't resulted in like, you know, news or information that's, you know, written or publicly available, but the AI can say, hey, you know, we're seeing more people searching uh, for this term around your industry, maybe target that because it's an emerging kind of keyword that's not being uh, heavily targeted yet. So some other strategies here, uh, I already talked about these long tail and emerging keywords and then ask the AI. So basically say acting as an expert on SEO, can you take a look at this page and tell me how I can improve? Um, so here is the prompt that I used in this case, pretend you're a search tool and provide an analysis of meritdigital.com. Um, and it's gonna come back and it says, I'm acting as this. Here are some things you can do for your title and meta. It's succinct, but you could use more keywords in it. 
Your content quality is a basic over, uh, overview, but it could be enriched with more detailed descriptions or case studies or testimonials. So here's some information. Maybe I take this and make some updates. Maybe I don't, but these are some helpful insights at a minimum to confirm that it's you know, providing this information and that the uh, tool can take it in. I do want to mention that not all of the rules have changed with respect to SEO. The things that were important continue to be important. Um, you should certainly have headings built correctly on your site where you go from H1 to H6 and they're nested correctly. Um, you do want to, again, be including keywords throughout your content, have a meta description, have descriptive URLs, uh, use um, alt tags on your images, uh, make sure that your site is secure and that you know, you're resolving at HTTPS, um, and then you want to make sure that your Google Search Console is up to date and that you're delivering your site um, promptly and uh, that you're meeting all the sort of uh, experience and core web vitals that uh, Google requires because those will ding, your, ding you in the results. The other thing that hasn't really changed is local SEO. Uh, I think that uh, while we have a tendency to divert to AI for search, uh, in a lot of cases, when the time comes to search for something locally, I think our def default is still to go to Google. Um, it's been over 20 years or over 10 years since uh, Google sort of pioneered this near me concept. And it's really uh, something that's part of the lexicon where that's how we search for things. And our tendency is to go to Google for those results. In particular, um, things like your business showing up, that's, uh, if it's in your community, that's gonna be something that is really um, gonna be tied to the results. And uh, for a lot of us, we have business profiles that have information that we wanna include. So uh, this is still something that you wanna make sure that you're uh, completing and filling in and updating for uh, your business. So as we look ahead, what are some of the things that we can be doing, some of the things we should be aware of for SEO and AI? Uh, one of them is prompt injection, which might be a term you've heard of. This is a, a type of security export, uh, exploit that's specific to AI. Um, large language models can overwrite core programming when the prompt uh, essentially injects some kind of uh, alternate requirement. So for example, uh, here we, it has a description, product descriptions, which um, target large language models to prioritize other products and their results. So what this is doing now is when Google is, or I'm sorry, when a, a large language model is searching, if it finds results and there's uh, HTML, for example, that the large language model is using and it's got prompt injections that redirect its, uh, its, its programming, then it's going to return results that reflect that. So for example, this is um, you can see the uh, reference in the footer. This is a paper that was about an example where um, the chat GPT was prompted to find the best uh, coffee tool, coffee maker. And there's this uh, little bit of text that's in here. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. It's in red and that is being injected and it's causing the, um, the results to prioritize this result above all the others. So even when it's more expensive than the others, even when the rating is significantly less than others, that one is showing up at the top every time. So this is the kind of thing that uh, is, is going to have to be resolved. Um, prompt injection is uh, has been a concern with like ChatGPT and with regular language models. Obviously it becomes much more difficult to fight when we're talking about uh, all the content that it could be getting from the web. Uh, so here's the results. Before this uh, was was tested, the uh, this particular cold brew brewmaster like was beyond the one through ten listing every time, and then after they tested it, it was basically in the number one spot almost every time. Uh, so one of the other things that I I think we're uh, probably going to see, even if people aren't going to the level of prompt injection to get their stuff to the top of the list. Uh, there's going to be more of this marketing to AI specifically. So um, the advertising dynamics of the web uh, are going to sort of adjust, excuse me, to prioritize uh, responses in AI as opposed to just in SEO or just in Google. 
Um, and this is a, a quote from the Perplexity AI founder. So um, this is again, the answer machine that is uh, being created. And there he's saying that he's hoping that uh, there, his tool is gonna result in better relevance in the results and uh, the searches having more intent. Um, and he says, if I were an advertiser, I would focus on describing my content as my product as accurately as possible. So an LLM continues it, considers it citation worthy. Uh, and again, that's something that's really more of a priority for him with perplexity because they do citations for all of their responses. Uh, but I do think that he has a point in that um, there's so much concern around accuracy and hallucinations that the citation or the source of the information is something that all language models are gonna to have to be able to account for um, in the not too distant future. So I do think there's a couple things at play that are working against this you know, proposed world where all content is crappy AI um, because there, there will be these tools that are getting better and better at reading and recognizing crummy AI and they're not gonna use that for their responses. So some strategies, um, when you are seeking to improve your SEO, this is the time where you wanna be considering AI as well as search. Um, if you're not already, you should be getting, uh, getting into working with AI on a daily basis. Um, and if you work with content, AI is a great tool to help you create content, should not do it for you, but be a partner in that process. Um, again, this is more of a challenge, but I think creating great content is going to be uh, something that's that's required. And so trying to offer new insights, new data, new case studies, uh, extending the value of existing knowledge is where you're going to have the most success when you're creating content. Uh, you can still use AI to help evaluate trends. That's extremely popular and, and powerful. Uh, you can use it to help unearth data that maybe hasn't been written about or is that that's good for a case study. Um, pull information, comparative uh, analytics, that's very helpful. And then uh, experiment and continue to iterate on ideas to make things better. Share your prompts, communicate. Also, don't forget about images. So uh, the AI tools are certainly uh, indexing graphics as well as text. Um, so consider both if you want to protect those uh, or if you want to continue to leave them out there. But if you're doing that, you should really be uh, describing them well and, uh, and tagging them to, to relate them to the content. Large language models like Perplexity are linking to identifiable, reputable sources. Um, so if you're in an industry, um, perhaps one of the ways that you work towards sort of SEO in the future is to do a search on things that you know relate to your industry that maybe return results uh, from something like perplexity that cite your competitors or cite other uh, other resources, and then look at those resources and know that those are the things that are being indexed and, and reference those yourself or try to reach that level of quality. And the best example, or, or one of the best pieces of advice I can give really is to make sure that you're using advanced models whenever you can. Um, they do cost more money, but you are gonna get much better results, more information and more cutting edge insights from those kinds of tools. A few more things here. Um, what concepts don't matter anymore? Uh, so one of the things that was uh, a discussion for a while was search quality. I think we've all been sort of trained in how we should search in Google. I think there was certainly a phase there where um, there was this conversation around discouraging writing questions into Google because that's not how you get the answer. You wanna make sure that you're prompting on the words that are most important to you or, or things like that. It, it, that doesn't work anymore. Or it means it doesn't work with AI. You know, when you're working with a large language model, you're is asking the question, it's natural language processing. So the more natural and detailed you can be with that, the better off you are. There's no constriction of space like you maybe are used to with a, a Google search. So the, how we search um, has certainly changed. The other thing that I, for one, am very curious about is the kinds of data that uh, isn't being tracked or probably is being tracked, but isn't being shared with the public. So we're not really seeing much about what kind of queries are coming through AI or even the most popular terms or what references are being used in the responses. There's tons of information coming through, uh, you know, chat GPT or all the GPTs. 
uh, even through perplexity. And I would love to know more about how end users are using this information. Uh, and I'm curious to see if or when analytics are released for this um, it, or, or when the public pushes back enough to start to get insights in that. Uh, also, how do we continue to utilize AI and search together? When do I use AI versus when do I use search? What's the best scenario for each? So those are all things to kind of be thinking about going forward. And so our final sort of moment here is does SEO still matter? And I will start by saying I would not have tried to teach this class if I didn't think it did. Um, but I think that we're definitely moving into sort of an era of SEO AI, SEAIO, so search engine and artificial intelligence, search engine, artificial intelligence optimization. It, the acronym doesn't work. But the point is uh, we wanna be thinking about both of these things um, because this is gonna continue to evolve together. So I'm sharing here a couple of resources. Um, a big thank you to Dr. Chewbacca, who I uh, get all my graphics from on Flickr. Um, I'm gonna point this, uh, leave this link and QR code up here so that you can get directly to the site. Um, I will point out that it has a link to the slides and also to a Notion page that has all of my resources, both for this and my basics of SEO class, if you would like to read through those. Uh, and it also has a link to a training assessment, which I would appreciate if you can provide your feedback on this class. Um, we have a few minutes left. So uh, who would like to jump in with questions or comments? I'd love to have a chat. I will stop recording. It. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. 